A very good morning to uh, everyone and uh, welcome to the i3 private credit webinar co-hosted with IFM Investors. I'm Tech10 with i3 and I'm pleased to have uh, Hiran Monegasakera and James McKinley from IFM join us this morning. Um, Hiran is the Executive Director for Debt Investments and is responsible for the joint management of key credit portfolios, credit product strategies and managing the day-to-day -day running of the debt funds including IFM's uh, Asia-Pacific Private Debt Fund and the uh, Special Situations uh, Credit Fund. James is the Debt Investments Product Specialist and he represents the firm in the interaction with uh, investors. In fact, of particular interest is uh, James' uh, previous consulting background uh, where he held a number of research roles with uh, JANA Investment Advisors, uh, including Head of Fixed Income, Capital Markets, Currency, as well as being a consultant to a number of investors uh, here in Australia and New Zealand. Now to today's topic. So portfolio returns and uh, liquidity positions have somewhat recovered from the initial angst caused by COVID-19. However, equity market valuations and volatility make for uneasy allocations. And the aggressive action from central bank means that the yields of cash and uh, traditional fixed income portfolios are now well below typical return targets. Now, some allocators have uh, perhaps diversified into the COVID-19, say, opportunistic strategies, so including distressed, but experience thus far has been mixed. And for those who have held fire, perhaps with some caution or the desire to deploy into equities, or simply those who just want to add uh, to their credit allocations, you know, potentially uh, private credit could offer a compelling alternative. And this is something which we will do a deeper dive uh, this morning at the webinar. So in this webinar, we'll examine the market for local, i.e. Australian private credit, and then make comparisons, you know, onshore versus offshore, say private credit versus some of the esoteric ones like distress and CLOs. And then more importantly, also to discuss the implementation aspects, so the portfolio construction considerations for investors who are interested in this strategy. Um, some admin points on the format before we get started. So there will be a short presentation um, with slides that uh, Hiran will go through for about 15 minutes. Uh, thereafter, James will join us for the subsequent 25 minutes on Q&A. So all in about 40 minutes for this entire webinar. So in the meantime, for the audience, uh, please type in your questions into the question box that you can find on this app, and we'll endeavor to answer them in the course of the Q&A. Uh, a disclaimer here. So this webinar is for educational purposes only. It does not constitute financial advice and it's intended for wholesale and institutional investors only. So over to you, Hiran. Thanks very much, Pete. Um, hello, everyone, good morning. Um, I'm just going to spend a few minutes just running through some of the uh, things we, thoughts we have about the market structure and, and what private debt actually means in, in, in the context of the Australian market in particular. Um, firstly, um, the, the slide here talks to um, a couple of, a bit of, bit of an outline of what the market structure looks like and the very unusual nature of the Australian market as well, compared to what happens in the US and European markets that are much further along in terms of its development. The, and really the value and the opportunity in the Australian market in private debt is driven by the fact that there is a distorted and in, an in, inefficient capital market structure that actually creates uh, uh, a supply demand imbalance. Um, so what you can see on this chart here very quickly is firstly, the underdeveloped nature of the, the capital markets and the corporate bond market in particular in Australia has meant that um, the, the bank lending market and, and private debt in private form tends to be the dominant form of financing for debt, for debt capital. Um, the other unusual aspect is really around the, the market structure and the participants of the financial services industry. So we have a huge banking sector, we all know that. We also have a very large um, superannuation sector, but a key part of the development of capital markets is historically in other parts of the world been driven by the fact that there is a large insurance sector. Now, relatively in Australia, the insurance sector tends to be quite small compared to the other parts of the financial services sector. The other important aspect that creates this inefficiency is really around the, the superannuation funds and their own structure 
um, we have primarily defined contribution structure, and that has led to a very different way of domestic superannuation funds thinking about asset allocation. Even our tax policies are geared towards encouraging equity style investments through the dividend imputation system rather than debt. And as a result, what that means is allocation to debt uh, as uh, within the superannuation funds also tends to be relatively low compared to their pension fund peers in other overseas markets. Just moving on onto the next slide, um, what, what does, in IFM's opinion, what do we see as the investment universe for private debt? And this in some ways is a little bit different to what we see from our peers around the world. Because of the inefficiencies in the domestic market, we tend to take a very broad view of what private debt is. And on this slide, what we're showing is all the different categories that you can actually invest in, um, in terms of segments of private debt market that would actually fit within a private debt portfolio construct. And within that, the green zone within the middle of the chart actually shows where we see as the target hitting zone for investments in each of these sectors. And it varies quite, quite significantly. And there are some interesting pockets that you can go into as well. And such as um, mining and energy related financing, um, securitization assets or leasing assets, which are all very bespoke in nature, but provide you with a very healthy return for the relativity to the risk you take on and the security structure you lend in. In addition to that, some sectors of the market we see as being quite cyclical as well, such as property and project financing. So we do tend to think about moving in and out of different pockets of these rather than specializing in any specific area. Although investors always have the choice of specializing in one specific area if that's what they wish to do. So in terms of actual corporate lending in the corporate lending world or in, or in lending structures, um, what are the different segments that we have? And this chart just quickly outlines some of those. We essentially tend to break up the market into three specific segments, um, large cap, mid market, and then what we would call special situations or um, more speculative end of the end of the risk spectrum. And with the borrowers having some specific profiles there, as well as the level of leverage you should be expecting. IFM's focus generally tends to be in the mid cap and the special situation end, primarily because the relativities of risk trade off um, within those segments versus the mid to large cap space. We will opportunistically invest in large cap space, but increasingly it's becoming less attractive because the wide distribution of, of, of the bank loan product in that segment of the market has meant that there's a, there's a significant increase in covenant light um, structures, which are very unfavorable from a credit point of view and a risk management point of view. So we tend to specialize in mid-market direct lending and, and in the special situations mezzanine space where you tend to have better covenant structures, um, full maintenance covenants and lockup triggers, and the ability to actually step in and actually take control, which you don't necessarily have as you start seeing the situation worsen with the borrower in, in, in the term line beat style covenant like structures. Another area that we're very focused on at IFM has been responsible investment and the impact of responsible investment on, um, on our due diligence process. Some of you may have seen earlier this year that IFM committed to um, the, the global net zero by 2050 target. And intention is over 2021, IFM will be working towards putting in place strategy and a process to deliver on this target um, and preferably uh, well, uh, well ahead of 2050 as well. Now that, there are some interesting things to think about when you're trying to formulate that sort of strategy within the debt context. What we are starting to find is that ESG and responsible investment approach has some challenges in debt that you may not necessarily see on the equity side. Some of those relate to firstly, the ability for a debt investor to actually influence the long-term strategy of a borrower. Given the tenor of debt tends to be relatively short compared to an equity investor, that really takes a lot of work to actually achieve influence. Another is around measurement and accuracy. How do you actually ensure that the borrower provides you with the right data and accurate data that allows you to formulate a strategy that can deliver responsible investing and a reduction in um, carbon emissions within your own portfolio. There is also an issue there to consider around the apportionment of the emissions risk between debt and equity. How do you share that? 
given the given the difference in ranking within the capital structure between debt and equity, who actually shares the risk? How should that be shared? There's also setting targets within the debt context. What is an appropriate way to set targets um, for the long term if you have a circulating portfolio of assets that may only be around for three to four years? That is also something that needs to be factored in as a key challenge. IFM has always had a robust ESG rating approach um, when, we, when we conduct our due diligence in private debt. We've had that in place for a number of years, but in more recent times, we've taken some additional steps to deliver a greater focus and accountability in ESG-related risk at a micro level on individual assets. We've introduced a rating model that delivers transparency um, of the ESG risk profile of each embedded asset, and we've looked at improving approaches to asset selection and portfolio construction. Throughout that process, we have found some interesting things as far as our portfolio is concerned. And one of these actually relates to the, the fact that um, environmental risks within our portfolio and the type of assets we look at generally tend to be very low. But what we do tend to find is that there is significant social and governance risks. So on the next slide, what I might just do is go through a quick example of, of an asset that we we considered and show you how that how those these risks were actually analyzed and how we actually dealt with those. Firstly, the situation, the example here is for an educational sector business where the borrower was seeking to um, take out a loan in order to fund some acquisitions. When we actually looked at the business, what we found was that environmental risk is enormously low because of the type of business it is. It is very service sector focused, but it tends to have significantly high exposure to social risks, namely around human rights, community relations, customer welfare in particular, as well as exposure to other social impacts. When we actually analyzed the business, the areas we really focused on was the student cohort and how are they actually performing. For example, what are their pass and fail rates? How does this business actually compare to the wider industry and the public university system in Australia? Essentially, what we were trying to gauge is, does the service you provide actually deliver some value to your customers? Because in the long term, it creates a significant credit risk. If, you do not, if you're not able to actually deliver value to your, your end students and the student body, then you're not going to continue to have a high rating amongst the student body and continue to have students come through your business. We also looked at the structure of the academic board and the review processes in place. Furthermore, we also looked at the actual governance structure of the business too. How is, how is benchmarking actually performed? Is there a regular uh, process of oversight um, and, and, and compliance checking that's in place to make sure that you do not start to drift away from the service you need to be providing? Another real concerning aspect of this business that we needed to look into was the fact that the student body had a significant proportion of overseas international students. So what is the business actually doing in terms of integrating these foreigners into the, the overall culture of the university and the business? What sort of support services are there in place for their health and well-being? What sort of support services are there in place around English language support? So these are all the types of unusual things that we tend to find when people think about ESG. We don't necessarily consider environmental risk as the primary issue in a lot of cases that we look at in private debt. That's all for me. I might just hand back over to Tim. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks, Kiran, for, for the slides. And this puts a number of issues in context. I, I particularly like your, your last uh, case study because uh, obviously we are a lot more familiar with um, ESG case studies that focuses on the E part, but having an S case study, I think that that's certainly worth looking at. I've got a couple of questions there. In the meantime, I'd like to just invite James to join us um, for the Q&A. Now, Hiran, maybe I might start with you first and sort of backtrack um, on some of the points that you've brought up uh, in the earlier slides. Um, now, before I get into that again, I'd just like to encourage our audience to ask questions uh, through the box at any time and, and we'll uh, look to uh, address them as much as possible. So, so here um, I guess back down to to the, your second slide where you had the chart where you have, you, you mentioned IFM focuses on the green portion, uh, and when I look at the slide, 
you've got many types. You've got project financing, you've got asset back, and so on. And, and it seemed to be, if you like, sandwiched between, on the one hand, you've got your high yields and, and investment grade bonds. On the other end of the spectrum, you know, you've got distress and potentially CLOs. Uh, again, I guess for, for the benefit of the investors as the audience here, often there's some, some confusion. I mean, is private credit the same as distress? It overlaps. Um, can you give us you know, a, a sense of where the differences are? Uh, in, in terms of whether it's the structure, the risk, and how, how you, you look at it? Yeah, I mean, we clearly differentiate between private credit versus distressed in particular, primarily because we do not view distressed strategies as necessarily credit-based strategies. A lot of the end outcome actually comes through your expertise in, in legal manoeuvring and, and really your ability to strip a business down and dispose of assets. So in a lot of ways, you're taking a, a legal directional view and an equity view when, you, when you're looking at distressed assets than necessarily do, taking a credit lens. So we really differentiate that and, and look at that as needing a completely different skill set and, and an enhanced skill set that's more akin to equity than debt. Mm -hmm. and, and James, perhaps I could draw you in here. I mean, if you could put on, I guess, your previous head as a consultant, but in your current work with clients, you know, there's interest in, I guess, the entire uh, credit spectrum, different risk. What's been your observation in you know, clients' appetite for you know, private credit versus with the distress or, or high yields uh, across the whole credit spectrum? Well, I guess, <clears throat> I mean, distressed, distressed, I mean, the last year we've, we've gone through a, a classic period where you would allocate to distress. So what we've observed is a lot of um, investors in the Australian institutional market have tended to top up their allocations to global credit managers, so US or European or even global credit managers who may have a distressed capability um, to add on to their existing exposures, whether whether that be uh, a credit opportunities portfolio that they had or, or a private debt kind of um, strategy or a special situation strategy that allowed those managers to extend into distressed um, allocations. Um, and we've, we've seen enormous flows into that space. Um, you know, it'll, the, 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 the point that Tech made at the outset around um, somewhat disappointing or mixed uh, results is, is really just a reflection of the ability to get deployed. Um, obviously, there's a, there's a target rich environment, but there's also been a tremendous amount of, of assets that have been allocated to that space. Um, so it's yet to be seen whether that, that money can be fully deployed and, 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 the, and the results that they, that they would like to achieve um, being realized. Thank you, James. I, I might go into um, the, the issue around onshore and offshore. Um, obviously, I, I think I'm going to make the assumption that most, um, say, Australian investors would, would have a sense of, you know, private credit as, a, as an asset class or as a sub-asset class. And, and most have, you know, exposures to global, I guess, primarily US because it's, it's deep and it's wide and it's lots of liquidity. Yeah. Um, so, Hiran, with, with you first, I mean, how how compelling is Australia? I mean, it's it's smaller, it's less liquid. Why would an, you know, an Aussie investor consider Aussie when it's a much bigger market out there? Uh, I think I think firstly, people underestimate the size of the market here. Um, yes, it's not flooded with, with the number of players that you have in the US and Europe, but it is a growing market. You've got to remember, the Australian market has a very underpenetrated uh, percentage of private equity ownership here as well. That is actually rising slowly. Um, and that'll actually create a bigger market. Now, as the market matures, it will improve liquidity as more players come into the market. So we do actually start heading towards being uh, more aligned with North American and European markets. But really, while it remains this inefficient, this is where the real value is. If you can, if you get a, a two to three percent pickup in terms of return for the relativities of risk. That really more than offsets the, the illiquidity aspects of it. And frankly, I mean, one of the things that COVID crisis really showed was that, you know, liquidity today, liquidity gone tomorrow, right? So the illiquidity spread can mm. spread very quickly in a crisis situation. So you really need to think through what is your liquidity needs and how much compensation you need, need for that. And if you're getting 2 to 3% in this sort of market without having to give up on tenor, et cetera, that there's a significant gain there. Mm -hmm. and, and, and James, I guess, again, from a popular construction perspective, assuming, I guess, an, an Aussie investor would have some exposure to global private credit, how would you work with, you know, maybe your clients to fit in? Is there a place for 
Aussie private credit that sits alongside the global private credit? How does that portfolio construction piece work? Yeah, look, I think you can think about it a number of ways, but one way might be to think about, well, if you're making an ongoing allocation to um, to private credit as part of your overall portfolio, you might think about um, allocating on a GDP weighted basis. So you might think about, well, obviously the North American market is gigantic, the European market is gigantic, the Asia Pacific, broadly speaking, is is big as large, if not bigger again. So um, what we would talk about is the is the potential for growth in this market. The, the obviously the private credit markets are under allocated or underrepresented, but the growth potential in the market is gigantic, particularly as the bank disintermediation process gets going. Um, so, so one way to think about it might be, you know, a, a third, a third, a third, or, or, um, and then the other way to think about it, maybe if you're if you're thinking about it on an opportunistic basis, it's just simply to look at the relativities as you see them right now. So if you're if you're allocating fresh capital to private credit, if you look at what you can get, what you can achieve in the US, what you can achieve in Europe, or as opposed to Asia and Australia. The, the numbers I think will will stack up quite handsomely, and and so if your marginal dollar is seeking the highest IRR, um, you you can alloc- you can argue that can all, that that marginal dollar should come to the Asia Pacific region. Mm-hmm. And again, but really, James is following on from that um, sort of a slightly higher level. You know, where does private credit fit in the portfolio? Is this is this fixed income substitute? Is this credit? Is this alternatives and I guess when we think alternatives, you can further drill down to a growth or defensive. How does this yeah. fit in? It really depends. I think it depends on what strategy you pick within private credit. So if you're looking at a, a senior secured, um, double B, B rated um, portfolio, that sits, I think, firmly in a defensive alternative strategy. So as a as a complement or as a um, a supplement or, or um, to your US loans or your US high yield portfolio, um, whereas whereas something that's aiming for um, 12, 15 percent plus type returns, um, then then that sits, I think, in your growth alternative portfolio where you're sitting alongside your private equity allocations or, or even your distressed allocations. Mm-hmm. Um, I have a question on benchmark here, but um, there, there's a question from the audience. Uh, I think this goes to Hiran. Uh, this is on the market. So what motivates a mid-cap firm to work with you rather than with their bank? Um, uh, various. I mean, lots of different reasons. I mean, some of it's just purely to do with flexibility. Um, you know, banks operate in very... Um, regulatory constrained environments and they have hard and fast rules that don't necessarily work across the uh, it might work really well from the bank's point of view from a risk management point of view but frankly from a borrower's point of view you know you're telling me you know I have to fit into this box but that's not what I need so w- one of that the real gain for a mid mid-cap company with working with someone like us is is actually that that flexibility I mean we have mid-cap relationships that have been around for 15 years so they started off as a, a potential three-year lend. It was, you know, where let's let's start out and see how it works. But it's really worked, and we've been able to support some of these companies through a much longer period of time. So the relationship continues because the solution we're finding providing is there. We we can't provide the solution for transaction banking or sometimes working capital, but we're we're there to be actually core debt facilities that are there to support them for a much longer tenor. Mm-hmm. Thanks, Hiran. And, and again, and a question around, I guess, the, the, the sectoral exposure. You, you mentioned a bit on property, and I guess it's understood, you know, we've got um, you know, huge exposures to property market. I, I assume that um, uh, property occupies a, a, a good slice, a significant slice of your portfolio. Uh, and again, given the point that uh, you know, property can be cyclical, how do you manage that uh, within a portfolio where, yeah, there's an opportunity there, but the, the cyclical nature makes it challenging as well? Uh, it does. I mean, and, and this is unusual. So there are a number of people out there who specialize only in property and, and mm-hmm. property-based um, debt, debt strategies, and, and, and they work perfectly fine. But 
we tend to look at it always on a relative value basis and we are very mindful of cyclicality of property and, and how aggressive some parts of the market can get at certain points in time. So in, in the pre-COVID years, yes, we've generally maintained some exposure to property across our strategy historically mm-hmm. uh, over a long period of time, but it's ebbed and flowed. Um, for example, you know, in the in the three years leading up to COVID, we've been very concerned about the aggressive nature of some of the lending lending that was happening in that space, with particularly with a lot of foreign developers coming in um, in the property finance, the development financing market in particular. So we we really hadn't done anything there. Whereas brownfield property, we were happy to look at um, on a, on a stretch senior basis in a lot of cases. So so we do we do look at that, but we're very very conscious of what's actually happening within the economy and how is that actually impacting what's being done in a certain segment of the market. And we tend to move in and out for that Mm. reason when we think about property. Mm. James, I'm wondering, can you add in? I I recall, um, again, this is a different conversation where often uh, listed property is being seen as equities. So in this case, this is the debt side. I mean, for me, again, from a popular construction, is this more debt? Is this property? How, how How do investors, how should investors look at this when it's it's the huge property exposure. Yeah, I think you should, I think it's a debt instrument, right? So I think when you're thinking about, I think a lot of people think, well, I'm allocating to debt or I'm allocating an infrastructure as the underlying asset. And they think about the real nature of that. But the reality is what the instrument that you're investing in is a debt instrument. And the idea, the, the idea is to pick up a yield and not be exposed to the fluctuations of the company. You don't want the economic um, realities of, of the underlying investment. You don't want the, the waxing and waning of the property investment in your credit. You are you're allocating to, to that credit instrument or that facility to pick up the yield. That's all you're doing. And you, do, you don't actually want to see the fluctuations of the property or the waxing and waning of the, of the, of the toll road or whatever it might be. That implies that you're cl- too close to the equity. <laughs> um, you 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 want to pick up the yield, and so you look. So the job the job is to find the yield where it's most attractive for the underlying risk. It's not about if you're allocating to a property risk, uh, property credit. You're not necessarily picking up property risk, if that makes sense. You you're really sure. trying to stay away from that ultimately. Oh, well, sure. That's the job of the portfolio management team, of course. <laughs> Um, I, I guess in a related point, and, and this question probably goes to both of you around benchmarks. I mean, how, again, Hiran, you know, that the different risk return characteristics of different sectors, different exposures. So as a fund, uh, how do you measure performance? What benchmarks do you use? I mean, Hiran, from your perspective, and then obviously James, you know, from the investor perspective, what sort of benchmark should we be looking at? Yeah, so from, a, from an investment point of view and investment selection mm-hmm. point of view, we internally, we set certain hurdles and say, at this credit quality, I have to get paid this yield. If I'm not, if I'm not getting paid this yield, then I shouldn't take this credit quality on. So that, that's a starting point. Then in terms of portfolio construction, and how we measure ourselves of performance, mm. well, there's lots of different ways to think about that. Um, the, generally speaking, if you're coming from the fixed income angle, the way you really want to think about it is a, is a market benchmark and, and preferably a broad market benchmark. So mm-hmm. a lot of our overseas investors who, who work with us, they prefer to compare performance against a leveraged loan index per se. Now, Australians tend to be a little bit more different. They tend to think of it maybe a little bit more on an absolute return basis. So so a lot of the conversations there are, are, are focused on, you know, it's a, it's a bills plus. So what, what's the what's the what's the total yield return compensation I'm going to get out of this? And they think about it on that basis. So it, it really depends on who the investor is that drives that. Internally, we look at all of those. Uh, we we set floor hurdles based on credit quality, and then we also look at well, are we actually doing better than you know public loans in the US? Uh, so we to to make sure that we actually compare against the broadest range, so that we can be informative to our to our investors. Mm. And, and here I could stay with you as well. Um, obviously, you're focusing a lot more on the Australian private credit. I mean, to, to use a US, you know, maybe the Credit Suisse leverage loan benchmark or one of those. How how relevant is it? Um, do you struggle then to to try to compare apples and oranges in a sense? Uh, I, unfortunately, you know, the only place you get a perfect index tends to be in equities. It's it's not really possible to do that. So you have to use something that's mm. that's the most relevant and. 
the leverage loan market is probably the loan market that you can get most quickly invested in because of the broadness of that market. So it actually gives you a, a measuring point, not just for performance, but about capability of deployment, income generation, volatility, et cetera. Mm. So it gives you lots of different points of comparison. Mm. So you can actually compare against default rates. You can compare against you know, um, leverage levels. You can compare against coverage, interest coverage levels. So that, that data actually helps you set a baseline. And the way we think about it is we say, okay, Australian market, fine. It's a liquid. You gotta get a premium for that. You gotta get a premium for being in Australia. What's that premium? What's that healthy premium you need? Now, for an Australian investor, it's the home market. You don't have to take on currency risk and currency yep. hedging risk, et cetera. So that gives away some of that premium. But traditionally, you know, what we're thinking is it's somewhere between 150 to 300 points. And historically, that's what we've been able to deliver relative mm. to a, a Credit Suisse index. Thank you. And, and, and James, is it the bank deal starting point? Is it a leveraged loan starting point? How do we start to measure? Yeah, I think the the, the bank loan um, starting point is is a reasonably fair way of, of of comparing it because it's a similar credit risk or similar credit rating um, and a similar interest rate risk as well. So it is the most readily accessible way of comparing comparing performance. Um, it it is you know the, the 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 differential between private credit and 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 the index. So it do, does start to I guess rationalize the allocations, right? So the, the index has a lot more volatility, the market has a lot more volatility because it is traded, but then you give that up by by having a lower ultimate yield and and, and ultimate return. So um, that that's the that's the trade-off and, and it's realized in the, in the in comparing the index to to the, the market here in Australia. Mm. And and again James reference to the, the earlier discussion around you know whether is it a defensive alts and, and growth alts. I guess that also impacts on the the benchmark that you use to, to measure. Yeah, I think once once you once you're stepping out into portfolios or, or strategies that move into growth holds, so a special situations or a mares type strategy, um, you, you're then moving into an absolute return uh, framework. Most people think in terms of an IRR, um, and then you're thinking about the relativities to your other assets in that portfolio. So maybe your private equity portfolio or your distress portfolio or, or what have you. So the, the, the relativities become about outright returns or, or relativities to those other illiquid um, choices you can make. Um, and, and, and perhaps even back to the equity market itself. You know, obviously um, the equity market returns have been fantastic over the past six to nine months, but we're now here. <laughs> The yield, the yield is relatively low, um, and so um, the, the 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 outright returns that you can expect to get from the equity market to to these portfolios is is um, is uh, is relatively is relatively low and, and quite challenged. I would have thought. Yeah, I, I guess in some sense, um, again, depending on portfolios and investors' uh, objectives, it might be even be be logical to use an equity market benchmark totally, against totally. the strategy. Yeah. Yeah, I think one. I mean, you'd have to do it over a longer term time frame because yep. the volatility of the equity market, and there'll be times when the equity market has a has a tremendous run. But over a three or maybe over a five year period, if you can, ultimately your growth alternative is your alternative to equities. Equity, um, yep. if, you, if you can't, if you can't beat the equity market, you know, maybe by two or three percent at least to to compensate you for the. For the um, for the liquidity or, or the, the, mm. the lack of being exposed to those tears, um, you 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 um, you do want to have a, a premium to that. So I'll mm. go in the back of my mind three percent or thereabouts is a premium to the mm. equity market that you want to feel that you were getting um, over a three or a five year period. Um, mm. But yeah, it's certainly yeah. There's different ways of comparing the uh, the, the relativities. Sure. Yeah. sure. Um, here and there's a question here on. Uh... I guess bad loans or deteriorating loans. Um, so, what's your approach to working working out deteriorating loans? And a follow up question is: Can you be aggressive in uh, the Australian market? Um, really, the aggressiveness and the way it works really <laughs> does somewhat depend on the legal structure you're operating to, right? So, I mean, you know, the, the bankruptcy code that we operate to in Australia is not the same as in the US. So, mm -hmm. so there's a completely different approach you have to take. Mm -hmm. um, also, it depends mm -hmm. on the asset and the, and the business and the relationship you have. Mm 
Um, I, I mean, I got to say, we've been fortunate enough not to have many of those, but we do have this, the structure set up. So we do have a team and um, a capability that steps in if, if that happens with specific assets. But how aggressive you're going to be really depends on when a business falls into trouble, what's the path out? You know, are we looking at a situation where it's a stress? So it's a cyclical issue and they just need to work through that, in which case you're going to be supportive. Um, is this actually a complete change in strategy and you've got to look at divesting some assets to, to basically put it on a stable footing? Or mm. is this, yeah, tear down, everything has to go and the sooner you do it, um, it happens. So first thing is you've got to make the choice, which of those three is it? And then, and then the choice is, and then that, some of that choice is also driven by how realistic management and existing ownership is as well around the situation they're in. And that actually ha ends up really <laughs> driving which path you take. Um, so it's not really a situation you can necessarily do yourselves. Lenders can step in and do a certain, do, do a certain amount of them, be, be aggressive to a certain degree. But to be frank, you know, in a lot of cases, the best outcome is actually achieved by having a more coordinated approach and having a more thoughtful approach. So tearing down assets and selling them isn't necessarily the right thing to do. And, and to be frank, you don't want to be selling in a falling market necessarily either. So maybe sometimes yeah. being patient and, and riding through some of the volatility makes sense. Yeah, I'm just wondering if this has to do with, you know, earlier you made a comment about calf light and, and I get the sense that you don't really like calf light. I mean, is it because of sort of the bankruptcy related issues? Is it about transparency or is it just the market nature that, that you guys are not really into it? The, the, the reason you have covenants in a transaction structure is it gives a, a clear signal and a point in time in which lenders have the ability to step in and start exercising control mm -hmm. or at least start engaging more aggressively with borrowers. Under a cover light structure where you don't have maintenance covenants, it means mm -hmm. that the only point in time you really can step in is if the borrower fails to make an interest payment to you. Mm -hmm. So there's a failure to pay and, and as a sure. result, it's basically a jump to default situation. Whereas when you have covenants, you can have triggers that allow the lenders to step in and start engaging with management ownership and trying to work out a way forward before it becomes a cliff edge situation. And that's why we like to have covenants. Mm. That's the benefit mm. of having covenants is sure. that, you know, you get involved and you can actually turn, look at turning the situation around before it gets too late. Mm. And, mm. and that's the thing, because you've got to remember, I mean, there's a difference in incentives between debt and equity there as well. So how do you actually incentivize equity to be aligned with you if you don't have any covenants in the structure? That's really the danger you run. Thank you. Um, we've got a few minutes left. I wanted to um, get into your case study on ESG again, uh, that, that focus on the S part on uh, universities. And I, I guess my question comes from, you know, in, in discussions with other investors, often it is difficult to price risk on the value risk, and it is hard enough on the environmental side. Um, you have obviously listed out the findings and, and structural enhancements and so on in, in the particular case study, but in a case where you know the fo focus on S and social, how do you how do you then price the risk? Do you try to put a number in that sense, or do you, how do you assess uh, and, and risk in this sense? Uh, you, I mean, certainly from a sector or industry point of view, you have a view on where the starting sure. point is, right? I mean, for example, if you think about the the last two years in Australia, aged care sector with the Royal Commission and some of the poor findings there, you, you have a starting point of okay where's this risk profile going to sit and mm. what's the what's the get out of bed rate essentially mm. right for me to even think about doing something in the sector so mm. so you sort of start forming those sorts of views around certain s issues and and it really varies a lot because you know with with environmental issues it, there's still a narrow range of all the things that can happen in in the environmental sense with s it's so much broader i mean it yeah. could be anything from labor to um, you know, in this case, student welfare to fair selling practices, all sorts of stuff. So it's so much broader. So you do have to take a bit of a bit of a step back and say, okay, well, am I willing to do something in that particular industry? Because I know there's an S issue there. And then what's my sort of get out of bed cost or charge for, for looking at something there? And then, and then you start thinking about the micro level and say, okay, well, what's, how do I layer in the, the borrower specific issues into sure. that negotiation sure i mean qualitatively you've done really well to articulate the issues there i guess my question is you know the punch lines at the end of the day do you try to then summarize that and put in some quantitative measure 
albeit very, very difficult to do so. And you get our bed type decision. Yeah, look, and, and we do. I mean, when we think about our due diligence process and our credit analysis process, it's always a combination of the quantitative and the qualitative. So the quantitative mm-hmm. stuff really focus on the financials, the metrics, the financial modeling, you know, mm-hmm. margins, the business operates out of all that. Mm-hmm. But there, there has to be a judgment element, as with most of these investments, yeah. including even on the equity side, if you go into some of these industries, you're going to have to make a, a judgment call on a certain risk profile and issues there. And the only way to really factor that in is to really engage with borrowers and consultants and maybe third party advisors you may be using to actually try and try and actually quantify what's the scope of this risk. Sure. Right. I sure. mean in this scenario, in this particular scenario where we really got down to was well, you know, what we worked out was okay, well, you know, student performance. Well the best way to do that is there's a lot of data across the industry for the public university sector. So, mm. you know, how close should a private university be to performing a performance when it comes compared to the public university sector? It, you should be pretty close, right? If you're, if, you're, if you're the alternative, you're the paid alternative rather than the government funded alternative. But, you know, you're, you, the quality of service you provide needs to be relatively close compared to the cost you're charging. And, and that's the way we try and think about it. So there are ways you can quantify it, but then there are certain things you just can't do. I mean, you know, poor management and re- leading to regulatory be- breaches, things like that. I mean, that that's just a qualitative call. There's no way Thank to you. put it into hard numbers. This has been very fascinating and, and we're about to close here and it'd be remiss of me not to ask my final burning question. And, and it's, look, there's been murmurings obviously on inflation and, and we know the story behind that, you know, liquidity, QE and so on. I was just wondering, uh, wondering for the both of you, um, you know, is, is that an issue, inflation or disinflation? Now, I understand your loans, for the most part, are floating rate loans, so maybe it's not an issue. What are your thoughts, uh, Hiran? And then, and then perhaps uh, James will close. Um, I mean, my, my personal view is inflation will come through, but it's still some way off. But we do factor that into structurally how we think about it. So, so really, is are we going to go into a terminal inflation situation over the next three or four years? And that has to be compared to the tenor of the debt that we run. Now, there is some downside protection in doing a lot of things in floating as well, um, in floating structures. So, so you take that, but, you know, on the absolute return, and you, you do have to do things in fixed rate structures. So you just have to think about, you know, do you lock in fixed rates for 15 years or are you locking them into three or four? And then there's, there's that risk mitigation happens through that structure as well. Thank you. And, and James, uh, final comments from you? Yeah, look, I mean, I think from a, if you're allocating to credit, inflation is somewhat supportive to your allocation, right? Particularly if it's a floating rate. You know, if you're, if you're a floating rate, you, the, presumably the, the central bank will start to raise rates. So you're, 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 you've got that protection, but also your credit risk will almost necessarily come down if inflation starts to enable the company to grow into their balance sheets even faster. Mm-hmm. Um, I think, you know, when you think about from a macro perspective about inflation, obviously, the amount of money printing we've seen, the low rates environment, the the money supply that we've seen, that's translating into asset price inflation um, and seeing a lot of real assets be, be bid up, particularly property here in Australia and, and commodity prices more generally. I, I'm a little bit more circumspect as to, to how inflation is really going to run away when, you know, the, the, the amount of um, the output gap that we've just created in the global economy, um, the amount of underemployment that we've still got, when that was a big topic of conversation before COVID began, that's not got any better. Um, so I, I think those are pounding the table about inflation. I think we will get more inflation than we've seen, but I don't think we're <laughs> going to go on a new stretch. And, and indeed, that's part of the reason why there all the all the very essential banks have got their foot on the gas, you know, is, is to try and create more inflation. So, um, I, 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 I think we don't need to be too concerned about inflation as, as a huge risk to our portfolios right now. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's all the time we have. Um, this has been a fascinating discussion. And for the audience, I hope this has been useful. Thank you very much, Hiram and James and, uh, and the team at IFM Investors. Uh, we trust this has been meaningful. Uh, now, this is recorded. So again, for those of you who would like to review this, uh, this will be available later on. Thank you. Have a great day all. Thank you very much. Thanks, Thank you. Thanks, Rob. Thank you.